Whatever gets you through the night is all right. There's a song quite a few years ago, I believe by the Rolling Stones, and it kind of typifies our culture. We're at a record level of sleeping pills just to be able to get some level of rest in our culture. And we're also at a record level of rev me up pills. If you had uh, thought of the idea of five-hour energy, if you had come up with that idea, we'd be able to plant a hundred churches around the world simply from the revenues, the tithe on the revenues from that company. Isn't it funny? We're looking for ways to get energy for the day and then somehow slow down at night. We're on the inf- under the influence of something. And in our own city, we become reacquainted in the football world with the meaning of DUI. Uh, driving under the influence. And then we have also, those baseball fans here, become acquainted once again of a little phrase called PED. Are you familiar with that? Yes? Performance enhancing drugs. Under the influence of something that changes the very nature of my competitive ability. And so this morning I'm going to talk about the greatest influencer of all. In a world of brokenness, in a world desperately in need of hope, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so what you would always want from the pulpit is a pastor who is PUI, preaching under the influence. (laughs) And what I would want is a congregation that is LUI, living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. May you be pulled over for LUI this week. Let's stand for the Word of God. Now you're going to see that the comparison between wine and the Spirit here, hence my first principle. Just a few verses here, the Word of the Lord. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We're going to have some fun this morning as we always do. Two principles. That's not necessarily an end of summer thing. That's just the text. And as we finish Ephesians, in some ways we'll start Ephesians. What do I mean by that? Well, in your own devotions, and I've said it over and over and over again, and I will while I have breath, the times you spend with the Lord during the week in the Word are as critical as Sunday morning. This prepares you for a daily meeting with Jesus. And as as you become more proficient because of your teacher, the Holy Spirit, and whatever else I could add to the Spirit's ministry on Sunday, you become more acquainted with His Word. It's not as foreign. So once through the book of Ephesians is not enough for life. You could just begin to get acquainted with it now. Do you see? We could start the whole book again. And uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do Philippians instead. But you see, you are ready to meet Christ in a deeper way. So just two principles this morning. And... Uh, Forgive the metaphor if it's hard for you, but it's, it's the biblical metaphor. Experience the strong drink of the Holy Spirit. You say strong drink. That's exactly what the Bible compares it to. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, most people say, well, I can't even see the Holy Spirit. How in the world could the Holy Spirit be more of an influence than drugs in our culture? How in the world could he literally make a difference in the way I live? Well, part of it is, to put it very simply, is you're filled with the life of God. You are entrusted and infused with the very life of God when you become a Christian. And so it is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead who is living in you, who begins to influence your behavior, your countenance, your feelings, and control you, except there's a difference in the metaphor here between alcohol and the Holy Spirit. You say, no kidding. But here's what. Alcohol 
causes us to see less of reality. You already knew that. It's a depressant. Did you know that? It diminishes your brain function. Again, that's why we have so many people on antidepressants. We've got to get the brain working and moving and lifted out of depression and all kinds of things. But alcohol causes you to see less of reality. You don't worry about things. Sometimes when I've met people who've had a few drinks, they are far more articulate, not worried about what they're gonna, anybody's going to think. And they're far more expressive. You've seen that. And sometimes people rely on alcohol just to be able to do their job better because they're no longer afraid or shy or have all those inhibitions. I remember a friend of mine, his parents went to a church, and it was a lovely pastor, a wonderful man, but he did have a drinking problem. And I'm not criticizing the church. I don't do that from this pulpit. I say this with a sense of sadness. And I remember them saying to me, or the, a family member said about the pastor, he said, he's okay preacher, but sometimes when he's had a few drinks, boy, could he preach some sermons. And they're very serious. He was just articulate. He was free. He wasn't worried about what people think. You know, he was... He was he was not at all inhibited. It rids you of your fears. Now, you say, okay, now what, what's the parallel here? I must understand this. You're right, you must. Between alcohol and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit causes you to see more of reality. And it also frees you up, but it's a different strength. Whereas alcohol freezes the brain, so to speak, the Holy Spirit causes you to see more than just your own world, your own turf, your own life, your own fears, your own world, as we spoke last week, your own reality. You become in touch with, with God's reality. And we talked about Elisha in 2 Kings 6 and the prayer for his servant to what? Do you remember that? Open your eyes that you could see the reality of God all around you. And chariots and fires and angels and all this. Is that there's a reality that I'm not seeing. That's by the way, what we do in worship. That's why we sing. Otherwise, I would just get up and start to talk and preach. But in our worship, we're lifted out of our own world and our preoccupations, our fears, our selfishness. And we, oh my goodness, the angels are worshiping. All of creation is worshiping the living God. You see what happens? And then we also are taught perspective. I'm only going to be here for a short time. I better wake up here. There's something going on. What am I just, I'm just preoccupied, but no longer my focus is now on the living God. See, the Holy Spirit increases your view of true reality. The same way in the Word, you begin to see things you've never see, saw before. You begin to have insight. You say, oh my, I never got that before. I never got it. it wow, I feel like the Lord is showing me His favor right now. The greatest example of the influence of the Holy Spirit, perhaps, is at the birth of the church at the, the day of Pentecost. Don't have time to preach on that, but just to refer to it, Acts 2 is your scripture study for the week. And it says in verse 4 of, of chapter 2, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But now watch what happens. Just break it down real quick for you. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. It's a cosmopolitan city, huh? And at this sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Well, that was not that's a lower educated class. And now they're speaking fluently the languages of the earth. And how is it that we hear each of us in our his own native language? And we list all of the languages near. It says, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Verse 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But watch what they mean the mockers said. But the mockers said in verse 13, they are filled with new wine. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit in the, in the birth of the church, bringing the nations together, the peoples of the earth, in a sense, hearing the gospel in their own language, which is the history of missions. There was a sense they're drunk, but this is a different kind of drunkenness. They're under the influence, but my goodness... And they're speaking all of the languages supernaturally. The Holy Spirit increases your view of reality. God's reality. Jesus said the whole thing and same thing. The same thing. Excuse me. Not the whole thing. In John 16, 
in the, uh, she builds up to the high priestly prayer, the intimacy between the Father and the Son. He says to his disciples, this is precious. The Holy Spirit will take what is mine, mine, Christ, and show it to you. That's what's happening this morning. The Holy Spirit is showing you Jesus. He's showing you your life. He's showing you the gospel. He's proclaiming Christ to you. Put it another way. He's making Jesus real to the deepest emotions of your heart. That's why you praise Him. That's why you sing. That's why you're face to face with Christ. Now, here's the beauty of Spirit-led worship. You don't forget about your troubles. It's not a depressant. Many of you are facing very difficult times. Hard seasons. All of life is a very challenging season, by the way. But you don't forget about that. But in a very real sense, you're aware also of the reality of God's presence in a whole new way. And you're aware of the reality of God's promise in a whole new way. Oh my. Wow. It's not any longer whatever gets me through the night. It's He is more than able to get me through the night and to fill me with joy in the midst of sadness. Here's what Tim Keller says. It's a combination of humble realism. My life is still the same mess right now. Huh? But I have a surging joy with it. Humble realism and a surging joy. Some of you say, well, I'm getting older. I can't run like I did at 25. That's right. I'm going to face various obstacles as I get older. And uh, my family's not perfect right now. Not everything has come together in the timing that I wanted in life. And yet there is this sense of Christ's presence. And as he says to me, do not be despondent. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Oh, my. Oh, yes. Even Christ, as he was facing the cross, it says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of God. That's the whole scope of history right there. Do you see that? You say, well, what does that mean? It means that over the course of time, the Holy Spirit's influence in your life, if you are a Christian, is stronger than any other influence. The Holy Spirit alone is transforming you into the image of Christ, despite all your sin, as the Lord deals with your sin and my sin. The Holy Spirit is enabling you to understand the Bible, not just on the intellectual level. The Holy Spirit is allowing you to worship Christ and experience deliverance. It comes in different ways, in different times for people. The Holy Spirit is setting you free. And as we said last week, and that's why I said the text goes together, the Holy Spirit gives wisdom. The wisdom of God is ours because the Spirit resides in our heart. And so as we receive wisdom... We experience more and more of God. Now, will you experience it all at once this week? Probably not. You'll wrestle with the stuff that I wrestle with. You say, here I am. I thought I was controlled by the Spirit, and I just blew my temper at home this week. How could that happen? Because you fight with the residual effect of sin in your soul just like I do. Do you see that? That fallen nature, the battle against sin, as the Bible puts it. And yet, there is a peace. There is a joy. There is the very presence of the living God. Rachel on the signal this morning focused on, I love your presence, Lord. There's a sense in that simple chorus. And by the way, you'll notice here as we look at the text about different ways of singing to God, hymns and spiritual songs. That's faith church, okay? I love your presence, O oh God. Your joy. Your beauty. See, the Holy Spirit is creating in my heart a desire for the living God. So, I said, if you're a Christian and we're going to give you the gospel every week, you experience the strong drink of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it could knock you over. Sometimes it just gets you out of bed and enables you to face life another day. Face people you don't like very much. And move towards forgiveness. The cleansing of your soul. Amen? So drink well, faith church, drink well, drink well of the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit who comes into the life of believers, the Spirit of the living Christ. Second and final principle. How many times have you heard me say that? Not many. Wow, is that an end of summer gift? No, really, you'd want eight principles. I, I think that 
And it goes right along with, enter into the Spirit's song of joy. You know, choose to be grumpy. That's going to be our fall theme. Choose to get old and cynical, or you can dance the dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can enter the celebration, or you can stay in your room like the elder brother and pout and be mad and say, life hasn't gone the way I've wanted. Or you can join the incredible joy that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have together. And you're part of that fellowship if you choose to every day. Look at this now. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's quite a variety there, by the way. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, the Bible says... Um, Laugh with those who laugh and weep with those who weep. It really takes the Holy Spirit to do that. You know why, don't you? Well, because it's about us. In the sinful nature, I'm only going to cry about stuff that affects me. And when you get victory, I'm going to be jealous. You did what? You got that kind of promotion? Darn, why didn't I? Huh, you won a trip to Bermuda? That's wonderful. Huh. Oh, I'm so happy for you. You see? I mean, really, think about it. It's a spirit-led weeping to really feel the pain of another person. That's the Holy Spirit. It gives you genuine empathy versus triteness. And rejoicing with those who rejoice, there is a sense in the spirit of saying, oh, thank God, this is truly wonderful. And really begin to mean it. So you enter into the spirit song of joy in the midst of sorrow. It's a choice you make. Jesus said again that John 16 text, your sorrow will turn to joy. Not right away. Some of it won't happen till heaven, but it's coming. And much of it will be the transformation of sorrow in this life. Only by the Holy Spirit, by the way. Only by the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing, once again. This is very simple, but yet profound. What is the greatest gift in our life? Well, it's salvation, but what does it imply? It implies the gift of the Spirit. Think about that. That the very life of God could live in our soul. The very life of God could be breathed into me and into you. And of course, part of that process is the forgiveness of my sins, the deliverance, the certainty of salvation. But I get to drink of the joy of God in me as a temple of the Holy Spirit in this life. And you know what that's an answer to, don't you? Moses in the Old Testament cried out to know God. He said, Lord, I want to see your glory. I want to see you face to face. I want to see your glory. And, and God said to Moses, protecting him, no one can see my face and live. And yet in the new covenant, as the Spirit came at Pentecost, that Jesus said, if I go, it's far better for you. I will send another helper, the comforter, who will teach you, show you all things. In the coming of the Spirit, there is a sense of the life of God filling me. And if you're a Christian, over a period of time, you will change. And you cannot control that. You can't even do a little measuring thing on the wall. It's simply God at work in you. I want to see your glory, Lord. And for Christians, the gift of the Spirit is an answer to that question. Now, the Holy Spirit also convicts us of sin and cleanses us from sin. In the Old Testament, when David was face to face with the reality of his sin and his brokenness. By the way, David's a lot like us. You say, well, he was really bad, perhaps. You don't know the full extent of all of our hearts, though. But David, I think, grew the most as things were collapsing around him through the trials and the tribulations. And when he was face to face with the sin of adultery, he prayed this prayer in Psalm 51. We could cover the whole psalm, but just two verses. I want you to see it. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Now, David did not have the knowledge that you do. Really? Yeah. 
David did not have the teacher that you have, the Holy Spirit, showing you all things in the same way. The Spirit of God was upon him, but the whole new covenant, the concept of, of God coming through the Spirit to live in believers instead of a physical earthly temple, that had not happened yet. But when the knowledge he had, David said, My sin, I don't, want to, I don't want to lose you, God. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. I can't believe it. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to be apart from your presence. Don't leave me. Have you ever prayed that? You must have prayed that. I know I have. It's not even always sound doctrine, like you're going to not become a Christian. But there's a sense, Oh, God, please don't leave me here. Don't leave me in this state. Don't leave me. And of course, the Lord did not leave him. It's a beautiful prayer again, Psalm 51, about the cleansing of his soul. But I have to tell you, it was fulfilled in the new covenant by a greater David, the fulfillment of the line of David, the Messiah. And he cried out to God in the moment of desperate darkness, the same thing that David in Psalm 51 prayed. Do you remember that? When Jesus said, don't leave me, he said, Take this cup away from me. But my will, not my will, but thy will be done. But then, do you remember the cry? The cry of forsakenness? A cry that you'll never have to cry if you would abide in Christ. He said, why have you left me? Not, not, not don't leave me. Why have you forsaken me? Why am I in misery and hell and separation and alienation? Why am I in total darkness? Why am I in this horrible state? Because he took your sins and my sins at that point so that you would never be in the darkness, so you would never, ever, ever have to wonder about the presence of God in your life. Do you see that? It is the amazing reality of the gospel. And when Christ reflected on the glory of the gospel, he was overwhelmed with joy. I did this as a trivia question this week, and very few people could answer it. I, I couldn't have gotten it. The, the question is, where in Scripture is Christ overcome or absolutely overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, rejoicing in the Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit? That's not an easy trivia question, is it? People will say the baptism and the transfiguration, but it's not really clear there. It's not an obscure passage, but it shows what happens when Jesus got to glimpse the glory of the gospel. It's in Luke chapter 10, the, the sending out of the 72, the apostles' mission, the gospel beginning to go to the ends of the earth and restore the broken creation and bring the people of God back to himself. And after, it's a fascinating section. And again, I don't have time to preach on it other than to say, verses 21 through 24, the answer to the trivia question is this. Jesus said, In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Or as the NIV puts it, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. It knocked him over. And he said, I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son. And to anyone and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he goes on to say, he said, he turned to the disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. What was Jesus rejoicing over? The glory of the gospel. That God comes to us in our horrible sin and alienation and takes our blindedness and saves us. And he does it beginning with the humble and the poor of the world, and those who are deemed unwise. And really, the literal translation is Jesus was overcome with joy in the Spirit. This is so incredible when you see the glory of the gospel. Do you get that? It's a celebration. 
It's a celebration. Now, you can, you can choose to enter that celebration every morning, or you can choose to wallow in your own pity party. It's a choice you will make for the rest of your days. The Lord's been showing me His tender mercy in very unusual ways. It, it seems so little and so silly that I hesitate to even mention it. But he's been showing me his love and his tender grace. And um, here's how it's happening for me. It's through the game of golf. You say, that makes no sense. I know. I'm going to try to explain. I stopped playing golf for over four years. I felt it was a demonic sport. <laughs> I really did. Never have I experienced such a foulness of spirit where literally I could be having a good day and it put me in a horrible state of mind. Don't know why. I wasn't relying upon it for my living. But it, I got off the golf course and I just felt awful about myself. And I know you're all great golfers and you knock them dead and you've never known that feeling. So for, for over four years, I didn't even look at a golf course. I would drive and I'd look the other way. So that's the silliest game for people who are possessed by a different spirit. And then um, I just felt like the Lord saying, come on away with me. I want, you to, I want to teach you about the joy of the spirit. And um, I went back to my instructor, by the way. That's important, too, to correct some of the things I was doing wrong. And he's helping me tremendously. But I made a commitment that if I was to play... Um, the game of golf again, by myself or with others, that I was going to make it a time of worship, intense worship. Well, that's the opposite of a foul spirit, okay? For me, that would be a miracle. So I got back out early summer and started making usual bad shots and w longer walk, by the way, we get more walking in. And I just, it was almost like if you saw Nick Walenda when he was tight roping. Did anybody see that over at Grand Canyon, which was one of the weirdest things in the history of the world? He was just praising God intently. Well, that's what I started to do in the golf course. More so than in normal life. Lord, I just thank you for that bad shot. I thank you that I can be out here. I thank you that my knees can actually walk. I just thank you for the beauty here. I thank you that my allergies are not kicking up right now. So it was an intensity. And then it was hitting me just a few weeks ago. I was asking him to help me find balls. My eyes are not that great out there. And I said, Lord, you be my eyes. You be my eyes. This is silly stuff. But I felt like his presence was so real. Then I thought about it. I said, Lord, why am I even talking to you about this stuff with the situation in Egypt right now? There's really hard things in the universe. This is, there's terrible things happening all over the world. And I'm worrying about golf shots. And I'm praising you for my pitching iron. And, and, and he said, wait a minute. What are you saying? Haven't you taught all along that I delight in you? And there's an enjoyment of God? I said, yeah. I was really asking the question, how can I talk to you about silly things when Egypt is falling apart? I haven't taught you that. There's a drivenness. And so I felt, and by the way, once that carries over, what used to be a foul spot, now I'll start praising him all day long, you see? Not completely yet. Because when I'm on a golf course, I praise him the whole time. Lest I have that foul spirit come back. Who cares where the shots go? Mickelson's not worried about me. Nor is Tiger. You see? But then I said, wait a minute. All day long, I'm going to focus on you, God. I'm going to enter your joy. Because the littlest thing I ask you for are your tender mercy to me. May you begin to experience the glory of God that way. The joy of the Spirit. You know, I may never be a good golfer. It doesn't matter. But that time with Jesus is just so precious to me. I felt like he called me there to be in his presence. Isn't that weird? Oh, my. And that's what the Bible is saying here. Do a song in your heart. Praise him. Praise him if you can have a strawberry Sunday this afternoon. Make melody in your heart. Some of you face very difficult circumstances. But don't miss the joy of of the Spirit. Then the, the Paul ends this section with something very simple. Give thanks always. That's the, 
that Nick Walinda, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I praise you. And then it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you're going to enter the joy of the celebration of Christ, you can't have an arrogant spirit towards one another. The Holy Spirit changes the way we see one another, treat one another, love one another, forgive one another. And it absolutely challenges the way we look down on one another. And so I say to you, Faith Church, take a strong drink of the Spirit of God and let it give you joy in the midst of sadness and disappointment. Drink of the goodness and mercy of God. Forget about the things that are just besetting your mind and understand the glory of the gospel. The Christ cried out, You have left me. I'm alone. I'm dying for you. So that you would never, ever, ever, ever wonder where the Holy Spirit is in your life. And remember one final thought. The Holy Spirit makes the greatest sinners like you and me look like Jesus. And that's the most powerful thing in all the world. Amen? All right, let's go. And and I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have you come down and pray the anointing of oil, and we're just going to seek God together. Let's pray. Father God, your word is so powerful. It literally resurrects a broken spirit. It is the glory of the gospel. And it is a call to a celebration in the midst of brokenness and to experience you in the little areas of life. If there's anyone here who has never understood or seen the gospel, as Jesus said, blessed are are you who have eyes to see what you see that even the prophets couldn't see what you see this morning and that you see your need for God and that he's come for you to provide for that need and to provide a Savior. And his name is Jesus. He's more than a ram in the thicket. He's literally a sacrifice for all of your sins. And so you pray this prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for dying for me to bring me to God. And thank you that on the cross you took the foulness of my sins, past, present, and future. And so they're literally transferred from me to you. And that's not fair. But it is the glorious gospel. And you transfer back to me your completed righteousness. And that's not fair. That's outrageous. But I'm covered with the righteousness of Christ. And and, and, and in receiving you, I receive the very life of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living Christ who dwells in my soul as a deposit preparing me for the future glory. If you prayed that prayer, you've entered the kingdom of God. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Jesus, Thank you that you resurrected us this morning. You raised us from pity and shame and darkness and obsession and lust. And once again, we are face to face with the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Don't know how long this will be. Just let's be patient as we seek God together. Elders, please come forward. The oil is right down here. Groups of two. And uh, in a moment, we'll cut my mic. And then we'll have the benediction.